This week on the show, we talk about what scary movie you should be watching on Netflix, why going to the movies totally blows, and loose cannabis regulations versus tight cannabis regulations. Which ones do you prefer? Let's debate it on this week's Two Sides. My name's Tim Strombel, and I just did this intro blindfolded. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for tuning in wherever you are. And of course, don't forget to check out our social accounts at Stay Rooted across the board. If you have a suggestion for content, want to comment on a segment that we produce, or if you just want to tell us we're doing a horrible job, hit us up on Twitter, especially again, at Stay Rooted. You know, if you've been paying attention to the cannabis space the last few years, you would have noticed that a bunch of states and countries around the world are legalizing cannabis in some form be it medical, recreational, or some combination of the two. With that, we're seeing a bunch of different approaches to regulation and rolling out new cannabis systems. Some governing bodies are taking a more loose approach where it's easier to get licenses so you can try to compete on an open market, while others are taking a much tighter approach by limiting licenses and cautiously expanding the program as it develops. And that got me thinking. Neither path really seems to be foolproof, and when you ask people, it's kind of like a boxer's or brief scenario. People are kind of up in the air. Tight regulation, loose regulation. So I figured, let's debate it on this week's Two Sides. On one hand, I'm in favor of tight regulation when it comes to new legal cannabis systems being rolled out. It's much easier to build successful infrastructure on a small scale, and then apply it to your systems in a scalable fashion as you expand. Then if something bad happens or you hit a snag, you can quickly address it before it becomes a bigger problem. Plus you can control production and distribution to an extent, which would keep prices steady and prevent a surplus of crop like we've seen in states like Oregon, who have allowed so much cultivation that prices have dropped to the point that many cultivators have been put out of business. You can't just go from no legal system to an open legal system overnight. It would be chaos. You need time to set up systems and best practices. So I think you have to ease in on it, start tight, and then loosen up as you go. On the other hand, I think I'm in favor of looser regulations and letting the market sort itself out. States like California have seen tight regulation lead to issues like product shortages, which have allowed the black market to continue to thrive because street vendors don't pay taxes and can undercut the high market costs that comes with limited supply. Simple math. Plus, the more licenses you give out, the less likely that a handful of companies could form a monopoly on cannabis, which I would, of course, be against. I don't know if it's true and if it would happen, but looser regulations seem to create a more capitalistic environment where the cream should rise to the top, forcing brands to constantly be improving their products so they can remain competitive. Plus, more licenses mean more people get to play, and you'll see more brands develop because of it, I think. It makes total sense to approach the legal cannabis system with looser regulations that allow for more competition in the market. I mean, that's how we operate just about any other system in America, so why not do that here? So what do you think? If you were in charge of a new cannabis system, would you prefer loose or tight regulations, especially out of the gate? Send us a message on Twitter at Stay Rooted and we'll share your favorite or our favorite responses in a future episode. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the show where it's time for my favorite segment ever and that's Wine of the Week, where I get to complain about anything I want. Seriously, anything. And this week, I want to complain about going to the movies. Okay, not the actual movies themselves. They're as good as they've ever been, I guess. But the actual movie theater itself. I think we've taken the idea of comfort a little too far. Especially the ones where waiters are coming up to your seats. Like it's a freaking Chili's or something. We're at the movies. We're not at a restaurant. I mean, when did we, as a society, decide that a full three-course dinner should go along with seeing a movie? It's supposed to be dinner and then a movie, not both at the same time. Who is the cheapskate who thought of this? I bet it was the head of the movie theater business. And he was like, oh, my wife wants to go to dinner and a movie, but I hate talking to her. I got it. I'll bring dinner to the movie so I never have to spend any actual time with her. Oh, 
I'm pretty much 100% sure that's how it happened. Now the longest movie out there is only like two hours. So you're gonna tell me you can't survive two hours without eating something, you fat ass? Come on. Now I sat through the three hour, 15 minute version of Titanic with a simple tub of popcorn. And guess what? Everyone in the theater survived that day. Well, I mean, except Leo. Leo always dies, but I blame Rose and that's another wine for another week. Anyways, now I don't know about you, but I grew up with candy and popcorn and that was it. And we were fine. Now I got a guy grinding a knife into a steak five feet from the back of my head while I'm trying to watch the show. Man, I used to think the crinkling of a candy wrapper was bad, but have you ever heard a guy demolish a plate of nachos during a silent scene in a movie? Trust me when I say it's as bad as it sounds. And to add on to that, how about these waiters that are walking through the aisles the entire movie, whispering at a volume where you can clearly hear them across the room? Someone's talking, right? But not loud enough to understand what they're saying. Is that not the most frustrating thing in this world? I mean, how about we just pause the freaking movie and get everyone's order in one round? Or better yet, put in touch screens or something like that so I don't have to hear the lady ask, what comes with the burger? You're holding a freaking menu and it says fries, which I could have told you by the way on the menu. Burger, fries, this is America, it's always fries. And don't even get me started on the leather seats that recline all the way. Have you ever been laying in a recliner or on a couch, nice and comfortable, you know, just watching a movie, and you think to yourself, you know what would make this better? If 50 other people who just ate would lay down next to me. Should I know them? No, complete strangers. It's like a never ending game of, hey, where did that fart come from? Is that fart? So long story short, going to the movies continues to be awesome if, just like everything else in life, there were no other people there. So what's your least favorite part about going to the movies? Or do you have a wine of a week you want us to cover? Tweet your responses to at stay rooted and we'll pick our favorite responses for a future show. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the show. Time now for a segment called I've seen every scary movie on Netflix because we know you spend hours trying to figure out what to watch. So we figured we would help you out a little bit. This week I watched He's Out There. Okay, here's the summary. Are you ready? I'm gonna do the voice. <clears throat> While vacationing at a remote lake house, a mother and her daughters become pawns in a twisted game of an axe-wielding psychopath. That was not bad. Spoiler alert, right? Tell us who did it right off the bat. Anyways. So the movie begins with a mom and two daughters heading up to the cabin. Now the father was supposed to go with them, but he was like, I've got some business to take care of and it can only happen right now. So I'll meet up with you guys tonight, maybe around midnight. Middle of the night, I mean, come on, that sounds bad out of the gate. And she's like, yeah, whatever, you better make it up to us. Why would you ever send your wife and two young daughters to a remote cabin in the woods by themselves? Terrible move. Has anything good ever happened after that? So they head up to the cabin where they conveniently run into a guy who tells them that the previous occupants had a son who went missing and a bunch of weird stuff has been going on. And the guy's like, all right, good luck, have fun with that information I just told you. So they settle in, the kids sneak off and find some weird tea party set up in the woods where one of them eats a poison cupcake, which is really weird and they never really explain it, but it's relevant as the story goes along, so I figured I'd tell you. So then later on, the dad calls the mom while she's at the cabin and is like, is everything okay? And she's like, nah, it's kind of shady. Some weird stuff's been going on. You should get here pretty quick. And the dad's like, okay, I'm just stopping off with the store for some eggs. What? What's happening here? I don't understand it. So the mom and the kids are scared and they're in one of the upstairs bedrooms and the mom's like, okay, we just have to wait for your dad to get here and we'll be fine. And one of the kids, the one who ate the poison cupcake and looks like she's about to die, is like, but dad is here. And the mom's like, where? And she looks outside, but it's not the dad. It's just some dude standing there like, is there anything scarier than looking out the window, seeing some, person, look inside your house and just not moving. Finally, night falls and weird stuff starts going down. The phone lines go out. The car gets sabotaged when they try to leave. And the dad, well, let's just say he makes it to the house, but he doesn't save the day. 
Long story short, going out to a remote cabin in the woods where no one can help you or hear you scream is already something I was not pumped on trying, but watching this movie confirmed my gut is 100% right, and anyone who does go out to a remote cabin in the woods is just asking to be moited. Overall, this movie delivers on suspense, a few scares, and a solid ending that harkens back to the scary movies of yore. And because of that, we're going to give it a rooted TV seal of approval. Go check it out. Don't think I've seen every scary movie on Netflix. I have, by the way. Or you want us to review one, tweet us at Stay Rooted, and maybe your response will make it on our show. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the show. Our featured Rooted podcast interview this week focuses on some killer new technology in the cannabis space. Well, I mean, it's not exactly new technology as it was initially developed and implemented for tissue sterilization in the medical field. For things like ligament surgery, for example, it's crazy. Now it's being used to sterilize, rehydrate, or even infuse cannabis flour. Alan Novotny, the CEO of Puragen, the company who created this product, joined us on the podcast to talk about this game-changing piece of machinery simply called the box. So I've spent the last uh, 22 years of my life in the transplant tissue arena. I uh, owned a facility uh, which had a 25,000 square foot clean room and laboratory uh, in which we would take in cadavers and we would disarticulate the cadavers. Uh, we would fashion them and remove the bone, the skin, um, the tendons uh, in various parts and make implants out of them. So if you know anybody who's ever had a cervical fusion or a lumbar fusion or an ACL, a lot of athletes have this done. They use cadaveric tissue, that's what we did. But I sold that business uh, about five, six years ago. And I, about three years ago, I heard about a man in California who actually died uh, from inhaling contaminated uh, flour. He was an HIV patient, he had very low immune system. Uh, and when I heard that, I knew that, you know, I could help uh, because I've had so much experience in sterilization. And so when you start in the medical field years ago, you must have had no idea that the cannabis industry would be, you know, where you'd end up 20 years from yeah, then, right? Well, yeah, yeah, there was no cannabis industry, right? So I would never imagine a million years that I'd be in the cannabis industry. But uh, there's a lot of science to be had. And there's a lot of contribution that I feel that we can give to the marketplace uh, not only giving a, a safer product, but even a better product. You know, when you remove all the pathogens out of flour, uh, and if you like flour, the smoking experience is exceptional. Uh, the, 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 it's the smoothest draw and smoke you'll ever experience because it's purely, it's absolutely clean uh, to the core. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking at uh, really, I, I can see some really high-end products coming out of this, taking a really high-end bud and then treating it, even though it's not contaminating, but treating it to give that absolute excellent experience uh, for smooth smoke. Head over to iTunes, SoundCloud, or StayRooted.com to listen or download podcast episodes. Also, do us a favor and leave us a review so we can continue to grow the show. Time now to share with you some of our favorite and least favorite things of the week. Let's kick it off on a positive note like we always do as U.S. beer giants like Coors, Budweiser, and more are making their way into the cannabis space, investing huge amounts of money in an effort to create both THC and CBD-infused beverages for the marketplace. Why do I love this? Well, because huge companies like this don't make this move unless they 100% see a future payoff. And the federal legalization of cannabis is really the only way that happens, right? So it's a great sign that legalization could be imminent. It also means more CBD-infused beverages will hit the market, hopefully quality beverages at affordable prices, because I'm all about that CBD action. Now something we're not so excited about, as U.S. beer giants like Coors, Budweiser, and more are making their way into the cannabis space, leaving many people worried that, among other things, supply will go up and quality will go down. Which I'm pretty sure, by the way, is Budweiser's motto. Budweiser, drink it when you're out of options. Now I'm not sure if that's true, and full disclosure, I'm a Coors banquet man. Please sponsor me, Coors, I'd like your beer. 
Anyways, we all knew this would happen eventually, and hopefully regulatory standards will keep product quality high, but if it ends up like the liquor industry, for example, then watch out, because there is some grade A crap in a can headed to your local shelves. Only from Budweiser, not from Coors. Again, I'm a Coors guy. Okay, end on positive vibes only. I never thought I would say this, but the governor of Florida makes the favorite list this week, announcing his intentions to ensure medical cannabis law in his state works for the people. My political voice, I don't... Previously, medical cannabis could be in pill, vape, oil, or edible form, but smoking it was still illegal, which made many people think, what are we doing? This makes no sense. Governor Ron DeSantis agreed with that, and he said, and I quote, What the Florida legislature has done to implement the people's will has not been done in accordance with what the amendment envisioned. Whether patients have to smoke it or not, who am I to judge that? I want people to be able to have their suffering relieved. We have a lot of fish to fry in Florida. The last thing I want to do is be cleaning up something that should have been done two years ago. I don't want to continue fighting some of these old battles. I talk slower because it's political, I don't know. I have to say it truly makes me happy when I see someone doing the right thing or even the thing that's obvious and makes sense. And so for that, Governor Ron DeSantis is one of our favorite things this week. So those are our favorite and least favorite things of the week. Which one did you like or dislike the most? Or do you want to share your favorite thing with us? Hit us up on Twitter, at StayRooted, and let us know your thoughts. <sighs> That's going to do it for us on the show this week. Big thanks to our friends over at Cannabis Club TV and High Times TV for continuing to air our content. My name is Tim Strombel, and I'll remind you one more time to work hard, be humble, and stay rooted.